presentations. My mentor in urology was Lowell King, and I thought for a long time that I was going to be a pediatric urologist. Uh, but uh, uh, I ended up in uh, focus in advanced cancers, and I feel very fortunate. I, 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 I wish I had attended the, the debate yesterday. I, I'm a big believer that urologists should be integrally involved in uh, the treatment of advanced geo-oncology and prostate cancer. Um, I apologize that I cannot, uh, I'm not fluent in Hebrew. Uh, when I attended uh, uh, my religious training, I do remember uh, always being, the teacher always saying to me, Neil, sheket pavakasha. <laughs> so it always stuck with me, so always talking out of turn. But anyway, thank you very much for allowing me to, to present to you today. Uh, this first presentation, I have one to follow, the, the coffee break, is uh, on this algorithm that you very nicely presented. And I, I'll, I'll show you in my next talk an algorithm that I've put together on all of the different biomarkers that are now facing us as urologists. And sometimes uh, some have described this as drinking out of a fire hose. There's a new biomarker that gets described virtually every other day, and I'm perennially being asked now to review literature. And we have to be very careful in to making sure that we understand who is doing the right science, what companies are really following a good methodology for bringing it to our clinics so that we can have true actionable information. That's one of the key things about the presentations I hope I can impart today is that this is information that should significantly change what you do with your treatment decisions with the patient. That's what's really important. We ought to order tests that are going to change our clinical paradigm. So here are some of my disclosures. These are really not even a complete list of the research that I'm doing, but it's a, a list I think that's fairly complete where I've done research and where I've also been asked to be a consultant or on an advisory board. So it's always good, to, I think, to start first with a case, and this is from uh, Peter Scardino, who is the chairman of uh, urology at Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. He'd previously been at Baylor. And here's a 59-year-old man, a PSA 5.8. He's biopsy, 3 out of 12 cores. None of the tumors have a greater than 50% core involvement. It's all, they're all 3 plus 3. He has a normal digital rectal exam, so he's a T1C. And his a PSA density is a 0 0.13, the cutoff being 0 0.15 for the purposes of NCCN criteria. He doesn't have any significant comorbidities and has a life expectancy, it's uh, actuarially guesstimated at 25 years. So what is this patient's NCCN, NCCN risk? Is it very low, low, intermediate? Um, I'll let you think about that. And what is this man's risk of harboring a higher grade disease? Does he have potentially missed uh, other uh, index lesion that could be of a higher grade, a, a Gleason 4 or higher? And using this, these standard features is what we've historically used, digital rectal exam, PSA, and histopathology, what would you recommend treatment for this patient? So just a show of hands, just uh, how many people in the audience would recommend uh, removing surgical removal prostatectomy? Nobody? Nobody would operate on this man? Uh, uh, radiation therapy? One person would operate on this man. Okay, thank you. I think a lot more would probably operate when I ask this question in the United States. What about radiation therapy? Anybody recommend radiation? No show, no hands? Active surveillance. Okay, well, I, I can end my talk right now. Because this is an audience that's uh, very forward thinking. Okay. So um, here are the NCCN guidelines, and, and these are guidelines, uh, and I think guidelines are important because they give us some pathway, but they're not always perfect, and I'm a big believer that we still have to use our clinical uh, gestalt. We have to understand what, uh, there's still the art to the science of medicine, but here are the guidelines as recommended for a patient with low risk. Uh, and so what one can see uh, that, uh, that active surveillance is clearly uh, there with uh, surgical intervention, surgical removal, whether it's open or robotic, radiation treatment. If I showed you the very low risk, then it's clearly the active surveillance as well as observation depending upon actuarial survival is the primary suggestion uh, for treatment option. 
what are our concerns around active surveillance? And active surveillance is not the same as watchful waiting. Watchful waiting is telling the patient to come back when they present with symptoms. Active surveillance is more in attuned to active monitoring. So uh, our concerns are what is the risk that the patient will die while I'm watching this patient? If something bad were to happen, and if I do choose active surveillance, what are the, the likelihood that surgery or radiation will happen anyway, and perhaps I'm just uh, not really serving the patient well? Well, this data in this table, which I uh, borrowed from uh, Peter Carroll, he presented this at uh, the AUA uh, uh, over a year ago. It's a compilation of a lot of different institutions and their outcomes of surveillance series. Now, there's, you can see there's, there's British, American, Canadian, uh, Japanese uh, institutions. The protocols for the surveillance differed the strategies for when to intervene or not differed. But the key part of the slide, and it's a sh relatively short-term follow-up, only really out to uh, somewhere between uh, you know, a, a few years, but the key part is the, the cancer-specific survival, the CSS, is 99%. So basically, by following patients in an active surveillance strategy, whether you're checking their PSA every three to four to six months, doing a confirmatory biopsy or an annual or every two year biopsy. If you follow that strategy, the likelihood of missing the window of opportunity for those patients who will get upgraded disease is extremely small. So active surveillance is not subjecting our patients to a form of Russian roulette where they may end up dying of their disease uh, in an untimely way. And Lori Klotz from Canada presented the similar data from the uh, Canadian Intercooperative Group and one can see again the cancer specific survival out to more than a decade is extremely high uh, with patients who are followed in active surveillance regimens. Um, here's just a snapshot and I don't know if you know Alan Parton, this is a very young picture of Alan Parton. Um, he's the chairman of urology uh, at, at Johns Hopkins, but we're now hearing this controversy. Is Gleason 6 in and of itself, some have, would even suggest reclassifying it and not even calling it cancer. The article on the very bottom is all by leading pathologists within the United States who are now starting to address this issue. And this has become a big issue, especially uh, in the United States, because there has been a concern of overdiagnosis and overutilization of treatments for patients who have very low risk, low risk disease. And as uh, Professor Dotan mentioned in his uh, 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 presentation, we know that prostate cancer is very heterogeneous. It is this very large biological spectrum of the disease. We have patients who will still die very debilitating deaths when they have a lethal variant of the disease, but yet we have a very significant percentage that will never have impact from the disease. Now the controversy I think within our community of urologists is what is that actual percentage of patients who fall into the category that can benefit from active surveillance versus who need interventional therapy right away. Now this data is already, it's not even contemporaneous data and it's, it's been presented very regularly the last couple of years at ASCO and AUA and what's interesting about this is the green box on active surveillance over here, it's about 9% is what the, the capture SEER data in the United States would suggest is what we are doing. Well, this is already wrong. This is wrong. I can tell you that there's already been presented in more contemporaneous studies, 2010 to 2014, that it, within the United States, in a, 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 a large uh, paper presented from the, uh, Michigan, that the uh, active surveillance rates in academic institutions and large community urology practices is now around 30%. And we just presented at the Large Urology Group Practice Association called LUGPA, um, a eight uh, large urology group practices, 1,800 patients, uh, where our active surveillance um, uh, for newly diagnosed patients with prostate cancer, all comers, 
And we've submitted this and this hopefully will be presented at the AUA uh, in New Orleans this year. So this data is, goes back to the early 2000s. There's no doubt in the United States there's a real sea change of moving towards active surveillance in patients who are appropriate, who have very low risk, low risk, and some with low intermediate risk disease. There's no doubt that that's happening. The United States Preventative Task Force has now recommended not even getting PSA. I, I, I totally disagree with that. But that said, part of that was because of our overutilization of therapies. So here's a paper by Calais de Silva, and this was in the, the British Journal of Urology, and it's looking at a, a cohort of patients of their pathological outcomes, about 1,300 men who underwent a radical prostatectomy, where about 266 had just one single core. And when they analyzed these patients, I think the take home that you can read from this is that the pathology from the biopsy was concordant with the final pathology in about 55% of the cases, but yet there was an upgrade of 35% and a downgrading of 10%. And it wasn't necessarily correlative with the volume of tumor in the biopsy or the volume of disease. So really what that tells you is, can there be another marker? Can there be other molecular analysis that could have been obtained before the surgery that would have given more information. And I think that's the genesis of the uh, Oncotype DX, which I'm going to talk about. Jonathan Epstein, who's the uh, head of the GU Pathology Department at Johns Hopkins, if you look at the patients at the Hopkins series who underwent second and third biopsies, and notice on the number of cases column uh, at the far right, there's a very, very small number of cases where it really actually changed the histopathology upgrading it on second and third biopsies. So his point is that most of cases with tumor grade did not evolve, but they rather, the high grade component was not initially sampled since most of the grade occurred relatively soon after biopsy. So the suggestion there is that if you had a genomic analysis early on, there would not necessarily be significant changes going forward. That needs to be validated with prospective studies. Now, most of us do our, our, our biopsies through transrectal ultrasound. I know there's now a movement, in, uh, certainly in Europe and the United States, and here in Israel, I'm sure, as well, looking at multiparametric MRI as a better tool for more specific uh, ways of targeting lesions. But let's, the reality is, worldwide, it's the transrectal ultrasound is the common methodology. And the challenge is random biopsies are indeed random. Uh, we'll go for the base, we go medial, lateral, maybe we hit the cancer in this specific example we do. Maybe we, 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 we get portions of the disease uh, and maybe we get the area that's the true high index lesion versus areas that are not. The final pathology for this would have been uh, a Gleason 7, 3 plus 4. But the key now aspect to getting a genomic assay is recognizing the multifocality of tumor with, on prostate specifically and the heterogeneity that exists, this biological spectrum of disease. So the profile for an ideal molecular assay would be something that we could take very small bits of tissue and thanks to RT-PCR, reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction, we're able to amplify miniaturized samples of tissue and amplify the RNA so that we can do the genetic analysis. That's been a, tr a tremendous uh, advantage methodologically. And we're able to then address this issue of heterogeneity and, uh, and try and identify the true biological potential if we undersample in our traditional ultrasound pathways. And so we're looking also now in this particular assay known as the Oncotype DX as multiple biologic pathways. And most importantly, we, if we're going to order this test, it has to be something more than just getting a PSA, a DRE, and Gleason score. So what is the test? It's a tumor gene expression, the GPS, which is a guide to your initial treatment decision in someone who's newly diagnosed with prostate cancer. It's for patients who have a Gleason score of 3 plus 3 or 3 plus 4, and I'll show you the validation studies and now there have been two. And why would you do this test? Well, you would do this test to help you better 
improve your ability to have a discussion with the patient to say, you need surgery, you need radiation, your disease is uh, more aggressive than what it appears to be, or indeed the opposite, you don't need to rush into an interventional therapy that might leave you with certain morbidities such as impotency and incontinence, not to mention cost, et cetera, um, and we can monitor you uh, actively. This is what the report looks like, and I'll get into some more detail in a minute. Um, here is the development of the tests, and I'll review with you uh, some of this in a fairly short order, but it started in the Cleveland Clinic where they looked at a prostatectomy study, and they basically culled down a series of, of over 700 candidate genes uh, and a subsequent biopsy study that was further siphoned down to uh, 81 genes and then ultimately 17 genes. Now this is about a, a, a almost 10 years in the making, so it's a bit embarrassing to uh, sum it all up in 20 seconds in a slide, but know that there was tremendous assay validation followed by clinical validation, and now the process is known, uh, the third portion is clinical utility. Will getting this test make a difference in what you and the patient decide? And we're doing that proactively now. So as I mentioned earlier, it's taking small volumes of tissue, one millimeter or approximately 10 to 20 microns, and being able to amplify the RNA specifically for a particular patient's genetic profile. And these genes are predictive regardless of the sample Gleason pattern, and they will predict clinical outcome in the face of the heterogeneity, because these are the genes that were sampled, and I'll explain that to you uh, in, in, as in the next few slides, based upon the most dominant genes as well as the highest Gleason score genes. <coughs> So there were 727 genes that were evaluated and we ultimately looked at these different from, uh, aspects from the ones that were the highest pattern, Gleason 4s, uh, as well as to the most dominant patterns. Now what happened in, in the process was we looked at really wanting to identify the genes that predict or had the, most, the best predictive value for clinical recurrent, recurrence regardless of the sample pattern. So when we started with the initial 727, there was a whole group of genes that were not associated with the dominant or the highest Gleason pattern score. And then there were genes that were only associated with the highest Gleason pattern score, but not the most dominant form. Remember, these are in, in, in hundreds and hundreds of patients that were analyzed. And then there were also genes that were only in the dominant uh, 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 Gleason, but not the highest Gleason pattern. And ultimately, we found were these outliers both on, the, on either side of the paradigm, and these were the genes that were chosen that were associated with both the dominant and highest Gleason to help with the multifocality and the heterogeneity of the disease. So this final selection with these, looking at the genes in multiple pathways, and there were genes that were found to have better outcome versus worse outcome. And the worst outcome genes were genes that were associated with proliferation and cellular organization, and certain genes that had better outcome with androgen signaling and cellular organization. Stress response and basal epithelia were ultimately dropped. And then we used a series of background genes to make sure that there was adequate genetic sampling so that the assay could be performed. This is a motion slide which just summarizes the last few slides. We had 727 candidate genes of highest Gleason, dominant, and these were all uh, fused at, at a certain point in time to, uh, down to 81 genes, and these after being selected regardless of the Gleason pattern. And ultimately, they were looked at their performance as predictors of prostate cancer-related death, advanced pathology, in other words, unfavorable pathology, uh, extra capsular extension or upgrading to a Gleason uh, 4 or higher biochemical recurrence uh, as well. And ultimately, this led to the 17 genes of the genomic prostate score, the Oncotype DX. And here you see the names of the genes. It's uh, not important to remember the letters, just to understand that these are multiple biological pathways. The reference genes are there so that when it's analyzed, it, it allows us to say that there's adequate tissue for background uh, comparison. So the thought process here was that combining multiple pathways would be more predictive than any one single pathway. Um, the uh, uh, next uh, 
this, this is the test that the, or the, the assay that summarizes all the work that was done by Eric Klein and his team, the first validation study, which uh, was done at the Cleveland Clinic, that ultimately that was the assay validation, the clinical validation was performed by Peter Carroll and Matt Cooperberg at the uh, University of California, San Francisco. It was to evaluate the GPS as a predictor of adverse pathology. Adverse pathology is if you had a very low or low or low intermediate patient NCCN based on biopsy, and when you got the final prostatectomy specimen, was there any upgrading to Gleason pattern four or higher, or any evidence of extracapsular uh, extension on final pathology? And here's their, 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 the phase one, the, the uh, first uh, 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 documenting a trial that showed a validation, 412 patients, a few were excluded for insufficient RNA, a final evaluable population of 395. As you can see, a relatively younger population, and this was a population that could have undergone active surveillance but chose to have radical prostatectomy instead. So as you see, it's relatively younger. It's disproportionately Caucasian. You see the PSA stratifications. You see they're uh, largely uh, a, a T1 disease and the low Gleason scores, but about 76% Gleason 6 and 24% uh, uh, 3 plus 4. And at the end result is that the GPS was an independent uh, variable in a multivariate analysis demonstrating statistically significant p-values, as you can see, whether it was up or down in comparison to the NCCN categories. So whether the, the um, a GPS score was higher than one would have expected by 20 points or more or lower than 20 points or more, it had an impact in terms of the suggestion for upgrading or, or downstaging of the disease. So we call these, what I'm going to show you now, these rainbow curves. And really what it is, if you think about patients, when, you, when we have a patient in our clinic who has very low risk disease, low risk or low intermediate, are all of these patients the same? So if I have a Gleason 6 cancer, one out of 12 cores, and Professor Dautin has, a, has two out of 12 cores, and we're roughly the same age, he's probably younger than me, but we're, 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 I think we're both under 60. I'm getting closer than you, I think. But are we all basically that same disease? No, there's variation, and this is what the curves are really showing you here, is that even in the very low risk category, we're going to have some patients who really are not truly very low. They may be low, they may actually even be in the intermediate group. And similarly, you see that for the low uh, risk as well. Now, when you look at the very bottom over here, these are actual data points of patients in Peter Carroll's UCSF trial. These are not hypothetical. So what these are representing, these are the patients who are really over here on the curve. Here are the very low risk patients who are pr primarily all low risk. Here are the low risk patients. These low risk patients are down here as opposed to these low-risk patients who are up here. Again, speaking to the heterogeneity of prostate cancer, which we all are very familiar with. And likewise, even in the intermediate group. So what does this mean and how does this play out? And I'll show you how the, the GPS test uh, works. So here's the, uh, the, the um, first significant peer-reviewed paper in European urology that was published uh, this past year. Uh, authors, first author is Eric Klein, the Cleveland Clinic of Peter Carroll at UCSF. And we have a second paper that's now uh, uh, will be pre uh, has been accepted for publication in the second uh, uh, um, uh, clinical validation, and I'll show you that. That's the Cullen paper. Uh, then that work that was presented at ESMO this year. And here is the this was just recently presented. This gives you your second. Uh, validation study, and they looked at two large uh, uh, military institutions in the United States and basically followed these patients with their archived tissue post prostatectomy, looking at the predictive value of the GPS uh, um, um, uh, assay. And I'm skipping through all of um, uh, the, the methodology for purposes of time, but this was a prospectively designed study. And essentially what they did now is we were able to show that GPS is now validated as a predictor of biochemical recurrence following radical prostatectomy. In the Peter Carroll, it was validating upgrading of the disease, upgrading of histopathology and or extracapsular extension. This now is demonstrating 
and statistically significant way biochemical recurrence as well. And interestingly, and more uh, pertinent, I think, in the U.S. population or where there's large African American populations, there was no difference between white and black populations, which oftentimes we see that there is variation in some of our therapies uh, for prostate cancer with racial differences. So how do you incorporate the GPS into your clinical practice? This is the most important thing. Before I get to that, it's a great paper by Tosoyan, and really they looked at the Hopkins experience of all their patients, uh, a little over 7,000 patients who had low-risk disease and 153 who underwent radical prostatectomy. And even in that group, the patients who had very low-risk disease, 13% uh, had an upgrading of their Gleason histopathology, 8% were non-organ confined. And so one can expect to have this, and this is a small percentage, but yet it's a real percentage. How do we better identify these patients? That's where you would use uh, this fourth metric of a genomic uh, prostate score, the Oncotype DX, to uh, better assist you. So here are these rainbow curves that I showed you before. It shows you the heterogeneity from very low, low, to intermediate, and those are actual patient data points at the bottom that reflect those curves. So a conservative approach to patient selection for active surveillance, excellent outcomes in multiple studies, and this is the 90% are in this shaded zone, um, and uh, if you go to the low risk, 35% of low risks actually fall into the very low risk, uh, and this is part of the Peter Carroll study as well. And in the NCCN intermediate, the majority will be directed to immediate treatment, surgical removal, prostatectomy, radiation, cryotherapy perhaps if you're doing that. And 90% will fall into that area, but there's a 10%, those right over here, that basically would fall into a low risk categorization. Now these three regions provide you with these guideposts for actionability. Actionability is capitalized because there's no point in getting a test that has cost to it if it's not going to change what you do. So we take these rainbow curves and how do we translate this into the report? So what happens is, is the report is sort of turned on its side and, and flipped over and these are how the curves are translated into a report. Um, as you move towards the left of the report, suggests more favorable pathology. To the right of the report is less favorable pathology. Favorable pathology, by definition here, is extracapsular extension or upgrading to a dominant Gleason histopathology of four or higher. Now, uh, in the, again, this is the Cooperberg Carroll's study. When we looked at these uh, roughly 400 patients, and we uh, categorize them as very low, low, or low intermediate based upon PSA, DRE, and histopathology of the biopsy. Here's how it broke down. After getting the GPS, the Oncotype DX test, it adds more accurate information. It gives you independent uh, assessment. And, and here's what happens. Watch how you see the change in the percentages. Now very low risk, uh, we move a significant number of patients from low to very low. So 35% of the men in the low risk had more indolent biology and a likelihood of a very favorable pathology consistent with very low risk. And as we know, NCCN guidelines suggest that very low risk patients uh, are, are clearly uh, highly recommended to, uh, to consider active surveillance. 10% of the low risk actually had worse disease. So there are patients who may come into your clinic, they certainly do in mine, where they read things that say, no one dies of prostate cancer, everybody has it by the time they get old, I don't need to do anything. And I find this particularly helpful in that category of patients where I can say to them, no, you have a more aggressive disease. Uh, you are the one person who may end up having significant likelihood of cancer-specific mortality. And even in the very low, a very small number of patients were upgraded as well to low or to even intermediate risk disease. Again, showing that the multifocality of the disease may have been missed on the earlier biopsy. And with the low intermediate, we can move patients down as well who might be feeling that an active surveillance protocol or maybe a less intensive therapy would be to their benefit. So ultimately, it gives you a more accurate ability to gauge your population's risk factors. And here's the different percentages to simply put in there. 
His two histopathology examples of patients, both with Gleason 6 scores. Will they act the same? Will they have different biological potential? Same histopathology, but what about their outcomes? Well, looking at them on the scatter plots, one can see that MC has a, a GPS score of less than 10, whereas WJ is 50. They both had a Gleason 6 on their histopathology. It clearly is reflective of that disease biology differentiation. So the GPS gives you an ability to be more precise in having that discussion with your patient. It's not a perfect test. It's not to say that we're excluding any of the other parameters. Those are still vitally important, have to be considered. So we get back to uh, a Peter Scardino's case of this 59-year-old male who has uh, low risk NCCN. Um, and he has a GPS score and it comes back with a, actually a GPS of 10 which puts him into, based upon the Carroll validation trial and now also the Cullen paper as well, the very low risk categorization. So and these are actual cases. I have several more at the end. If we have time, I'll show them to you. And uh, the patient, despite the fact being 59 years old, uh, agreed to active surveillance. And I would say that, you know, for, I've been in practice now for 25 years. Uh, I think this is a really remarkable change now in how we're viewing this. I think this gives you the ability to say to patients, uh, you have choices and don't have to necessarily march to an interventional therapy at the current time. Now, just uh, within the last uh, few days, we've seen the NCCN has now put in, and you look at the highline, highlighted red box over here, uh, and the NCCN now has stated uh, in their most updated uh, version for guidelines that men with clinically localized disease, prostate cancer, could consider a tumor-based molecular assay to stratify better their risk of adverse pathology, higher Gleason score, going from three plus three or three plus four, to a dominant four, or extracapsular extension at, at radical prostatectomy or the chance now of biochemical recurrence. So it's now got into the NCC and guidelines for recommendation. Now keep in mind in the United States, uh, and I, I believe it's also true here in Israel, these are not yet reimbursed, and that speaks to the importance of doing prospective clinical utility trials, which uh, we are, I'm actually participating in right now with uh, Oncotype DX, where we get the biopsy, we have a discussion with the patient, we, make a, uh, we have a conversation, we say, here's what we would recommend, here's what I recommend, here's what the patient wants to do. We then get the Oncotype DX, we get the information back, have that discussion, it may move the patient to very low risk or intermediate risk, and then uh, the patient says, well, now with that information, here's what I want to do. And the physician would also say, here's what I want to do now with that information. And then the third part of that clinical utility validation is several months later, what actually did happen. And this is how we'll be able to get a, a reimbursement methodology. So the validation study conclusions in patients with very low, low, and low intermediate NCCN risk categorization the GPS has been prospectively validated as a biopsy-based predictor of adverse pathology. We know that patients who have uh, low volume confined disease, these are the patients that it's extremely unlikely that they will have cancer-specific mortality. And that's been obviously demonstrated in those large retrospective uh, data that I showed you with uh, Hopkins, as well as in the active surveillance studies demonstrating its safety as long as we're monitoring these patients. Not watchful waiting, but monitoring of the patient. The data that you get from the Oncotype DX is independent, not exclusive, it's independent and used in conjunction with your physical exam, the DRE, the PSA, and the histopathology. And we're able to get this now, not with a repeat biopsy, but with very small 20 mi 10 to 20 microns of tissue, a millimeter of tissue, and it can be uh, mini this miniaturized tissue is able to be amplified so that we can look at the patient's specific RNA gene expression, individualized for that particular patient. So um, here's another case. This is uh, Kitan Badani at Columbia University. Here's a 66-year-old man. Uh, PSA 1.5, Gleason 3 plus 3. He had, for whatever reasons, uh, lots of cores. 33 out of 30 were positive, none greater than 50%, uh, a large uh, high life expectancy. And lo and behold, the patient uh, has, a, an NC, has a GPS that's suggestive of more aggressive disease. 
And perhaps, as you can see, the earlier pre-GPS recommendation was, oh, we're going to sur survey you, we're going to follow you. And this patient clearly has a more aggressive disease, and the patient went to surgery and on final pathology had a Gleason 3 plus 4. So it's not only to help you with promotion of active surveillance, but it's to better inform your patients who say, oh, no one dies of prostate cancer. We see this in the United States because we have certain articles that like to say that it, 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 there's so much overtreatment that no one should be treated. And yet on the other end of the spectrum, we have some patients who have such low-grade disease who would benefit from active surveillance. Here's a 75-year-old uh, healthy Hispanic male. His PSA is 16. He has a Gleason 3 plus 3, 1 out of 12, 10% of the core. He's, he immediately goes to intermediate because he has a PSA of greater than 10. That's some of the problem with the NCCN guideline, right? It's very arbitrary. It has to do with number of cores, core percentage involvement, as well as the PSA. So with that said, um, no recommendation. He had a, a, a GPS, and indeed he was consistent with intermediate disease. And so the recommendation ultimately was surgery. I don't know that I would have recommended surgery. I tend to be uh, less inclined in men over 70 years old. Might have recommended radiation. But be that as it may, this was a healthy uh, man who, who may have had a, a very good actuarial survival and thus made the decision not to go with active surveillance. 63-year-old male, this was presented again by, this is from Eric Klein at Cleveland Clinic. Uh, a Gleason 3 plus 3, 2 out of 12 cores, 40 and 60 percent. Because it goes over 50 percent, it puts him into the low versus the very low. Despite a PSA density of, of 0 0.12, 0 0.15 being the cutoff, but otherwise pretty healthy, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. Uh, he's undecided. He doesn't know what he wants to do. The GPS is obtained, and the GPS comes back very low risk. And now the patient chooses to have an active surveillance protocol. 65 year Fine. Thank you for the time of lecture. Good question. I know that prospective studies are. Uh, best way to go, but here uh, I would like to know whether those patients on a, on a very big cohort of active surveillance that had progressed, was a GPS done on them retrospectively to know whether they were uh, reassigned to a different uh, category? That's a great question and gets asked a lot. And that, um, there, that none of that has been published yet, but that is being looked at. Um, there's so many studies that are going on, and that's one of them. But I don't have data that I can tell you about that, but that's a very good question. And another uh, 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 corollary question to that is, we get the GPS, we put somebody on active surveillance, what happens two to four or five years from now, what will the GPS score be if they get a repeat biopsy and, uh, and we're, we're doing that study longitudinally as well? But it's an excellent question. Uh, 